petrichor is the earthly scent produced when rain falls on dry soil. The word is constructed from Greek petra, meaning stone, and ichor, the fluid that flows in the veins of the gods in Greek mythology. The smell derives from an oil exuded by certain plants during dry periods, whereupon it's absorbed by clay-based soils and rocks. During rain, the oil is released into the air along with another compound, geosmin, a metabolic byproduct of certain bacteria which is emitted by wet soil, producing the distinctive scent. Ozone may also be present if there's lightning. Ozone, incidentally, comes from the Greek word meaning to smell. The Greeks proposed the existence of five basic elements. Of these, four were the physical elements, fire, air, water, and earth, of which the entire world is composed. The fifth element is sometimes called spirit, or ether, or quintessence, which literally means the fifth element in Latin. In traditional Western occult theory, each element also has two qualities, and it shares each quality with one other element. Each element is either warm or cold, and this corresponds with a male or female gender, where male qualities are things like warmth, light, and activity, and female qualities are dark, cold, passive, and receptive. Male Warm elements point upward. Female, cold elements point downward. The element of water traditionally has a strong feminine connection associated with the goddess, with the inverted triangle used to symbolize water and can also be interpreted to symbolize the womb. In the Eastern Tantric tradition, in which women play a very special role, the inverted triangle represents the vulva, or yoni. Personified by the goddess Kali, who bore the title of Kunti, or Kunda, root of the similar-sounding Indo-European, or Aryan word, that starts with a C. The yoni yantra, or upside-down triangle, was known as a primordial image, representing the Great Mother as source of all life. Water can also be represented by a circle with a horizontal crossbar or by a series of three wavy lines. Many cultures feature water spirits as part of their folklore and mythology. To the Greeks, a water spirit known as a naiad often presided over a spring or stream. The Romans had a similar entity. Water is the element of emotion and the unconscious the color blue, the moon or Venus, the zodiac signs Cancer, Scorpio, and Pisces, the fall season, the sunset, and the cup or grail. In our modern culture, this concept of Christ being married and having children is often wound up in the sensationalized stories of the Holy Grail. Some stories depict the Grail as a special cup. There are even some ancient legends that say, oh, this is the chalice that was used at the Last Supper. A 9th century Psalter, or Book of Psalms from Paris, France, portrays the crucifixion of the Son of God with a Grail chalice near his feet. They believed that there was a bloodline of Israel, of David. Some ancient Irish legends claim that Jeremiah traveled to Ireland, accompanied by one of the princesses of Judah. Was Jeremiah perhaps a protector of the royal bloodline of the house of Israel? The legends of the Grail are wide and they're varied, and there is a sense of hidden mystery surrounding it. 
because even the famous stories of King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table are related. Traditionally, Arthur and some of his knights are claimed as direct descendants of Joseph of Arimathea. Yeah. Medieval legends claim that all unicorns were hunted and killed. Only a few escaped and went into hiding. Is this an allegorical legend intended to lament the fate of the Lord's children? Were some of his descendants identified and put to death? Mary Magdalene. There has been a considerable amount of speculation that the Grail refers to sacred bloodline, where some claim the Grail was originally identified as Sangral, meaning holy chalice. Graal is an ancient Mesopotamian word meaning nectar of supreme excellence which some have interpreted as blood, which was allegedly consumed by antediluvian gods and kings. So where some consider the grail as the chalice containing Jesus' blood collected at the crucifixion, in certain schools of Gnosticism, it is speaking to a messianic bloodline. That said, esoteric interpretations also point to a higher or refined states of consciousness as being the true secret of the mystery of the Grail. Well, it says Senza Blackwater, Schwarzwasser. There's the bear. There it is. Well, it says Blackwater. That's where it's from. It says again the Blackwater Bridge. There it says Grasburg, the Grass Castle. Well, grass doesn't make any sense. It must have been an L, like Grail's Castle. There it is. So I'm looking for the Grail's Castle. And uh, here is a, a cave uh, where we go through. And I hope we find it. In German, the thing is called Grasburg, it means grass, but it doesn't make any sense for a castle. Burg, it means a castle. Here in Switzerland, in the canton of Bern, that means the bear, as John saw it. And the bear has also black water in their logo, and this is black water here, it's called Schwarzwasser. So well, let's hope we find the cave now. Okay, there we go, into the cave. I hope we get out from the other side to the Grailsburg, the Grails Castle. So there we are at the other side. Oh, there we got Isis chair. Look at it. Look at it. Sisters of Isis, they're here. It's quite dripping here. So let's go and find the Grails Castle. Let's go. Probably do some uh, rituals here. Oh boy. Oh boy. So this is the tunnel where we came from. So the Grails Castle, I think it should be there somewhere or on the other side. Yeah. Well, there it is, I suppose. Look at this. So on the way to the Grailsburg of the uh, of Octogon, the base of the Templars. <clears throat> so on the way to the Grailsburg in Octagon, founded by the Templars. So if this country is founded by the Templars, as it is, then it must be the Grailsburg. They just left out the L to camouflage it, as everything in this country is being camouflaged and hid. 
and this country was founded by the Templars, as I told you. And there it is. This is the uh, the Grail's Castle. These guys from Octagon, they already ruled uh, thousands years before the U.S. was being born and founded, <laughs> and they are ruling in the U.S. I tell you. Oh, I tell you, they do, and that's why they call it Blackwater. So there's the black water, Schwarzwasser. So here's the Grails, Grails Castle there. And this is uh, here's the entrance for hikers. Mm -hmm. So there it is, Grasburg. That's the situation at 1500. I don't see very much in the LCD screen because of the sun. Uh, here is the uh, the history. So it really did start off during the cruise or just after the Crusades. I uh, mentioned that 1291 was the last Crusade, and uh, they founded Switzerland. Oh, going up the stairs here to the castle. Hello, you got coffee ready? There's water on both sides. Uh, here's the black water. Can, do you hear it? Well, the water seems to be uh, on all sides here. So there's the the black castle, the town, the black water. I mean the uh, the origins of the apart from from the First Nations. The origin of the uh, of the U.S. they lie in Europe, so this is where it all came from. And they took their power with them, the structures and their their clans, you know, and also the the Blackwater clan from Switzerland. Well, there's no doubt about it. It's all here. This is the Canton of the Bear. Canton that means the corner in Latin. Uh, there is the Blackwater. Uh, it was founded by the Templars, the Banks, the Templars treasure, the Grail's castle. And here's the origin. Uh, there's no doubt that this is a Templars castle. It was built by the Templars. There's no doubt. It's all here, folks. The other end of the Grail's castle. And there's some more water here. And the black water. Now that we're going down here, you get to the uh, the black water. Oh, here it is. This is the black water. Schwarzwasser. In the canton of Bern of the Bear. What John saw. This is Octagon. This is black water. And this is where the name derived from. 
Don't be mistaken. The Nazi Templars and Octagon, they rule over the Pentagon. Black water. Looks green to me. <laughs> now let's have a look at the town of the Black Castle, Schwarzenburg. So next to the Black Water, the Black Knights, the SS, is the Black Castle town. And here's the Grails Castle. Maybe they also call it the Black Castle because there's the Black Water, there's the small town of uh, Schwarzenburg, which is the Black Castle. Maybe that's several. I don't think there's a black castle here. And of course, as we know, the word Grail is from Saint Real, and it means the uh, uh, the royal blood. So the royal blood came here in the Grail's castle. They just uh, camouflaged it, as in octagon. They camouflaged everything, and then they just smiled through their teeth. So. Um, they just came here. Grail means they came here. They settled here. It's just another word for settling, Grail. It's that easy. Uh, phonetically and uh, etymologically, it's interesting to uh, say that the, the Bernese, different from the other cantons here in Switzerland, even the cantons that speak German or Swiss German, they don't pronounce the L. So the word Gralsburg, uh, Grasburg, or Gralsburg as it uh, used to be in German, uh, would be pronounced here Grausburg, because they don't say the L. So it, it, it is then, um, it, it could have been an L there, and it just disappeared because they don't pronounce it, the Bernese, the guys, the guys with the bear claw as the black water thing. They don't pronounce the L. So this, they thought, well, you know, why, why write, continue to write it down if they don't uh, pronounce it? So Gralsburg in German would be pronounced by these Bernese, the people of the bear, as uh, Grausburg. Okay, so this is the Gralsburg, uh, where the the Bera, where the word Pharaoh is from, which means the big house, which is not the pyramid, which is which is rather this uh, the castle here or the uh, the ruins. So the Bera that means the uh, the big royal house of the pharaohs, and that's the Grail. That's the Bera, the big royal house. They came here and they settled down. That's what the word Grail means, the Grail's castle, yeah? Oh, like for instance, the German word Verwaltung, uh, that means the administration. In Bern, that's being pronounced, pronounced as Verwaltig. Anybody hears an L? No, it disappeared. Just as the word in the, in the Grail, it just disappeared. So, you see? Quat erat demonstrantum. So today, actually, this place is the the Grass Castle, Grasburg, because they all come smoking a joint here. And but uh, in the Middle Ages, at the end of the Crusades, when they built it here, uh, there was no grass. Oh no, there were no lawns, no golf places or soccer fields. No way, it was all forest. So the word grass, uh, it's nonsense. It was grail, which I explained to you before. There's no doubt. And the grail is Saint Real, the holy blood of the pharaohs, the royal blood of the pharaohs, which came here. According to Carl Jung, water is a universal symbol of the unconscious mind. The lake in the valley, for example, is the unconscious, which lies, as it were, underneath consciousness, so that it is often referred to as the subconscious. A well is often representative of a sacred portal to the other world. So where the legend of the grail may tell of a certain bloodline, it almost certainly also contains symbolism 
to a deeper mystery into the subconscious mind and possibly the soul as well. The great cycle of the grail, which has become one of the most important descents of symbolism in the Christian world. During the Romance period in Europe, there were a long group of troubadours, many poets, literary people, persons in almost every walk of life, religious and secular, who centered their patterns of living around what was called the, the legend of the quest, the search for the Holy Grail. And in spite of a tremendous amount of research, and the research into hundreds of manuscripts, the problem of the Grail remains very largely unsolved. So this morning we want to approach it a little differently, not dogmatically, to see if we can see a little more of the influence of this tradition, not only upon the people of the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries, but upon the world as it is today. For part of the story seems to come down even into our own time. Where it all began is quite unknown. Uh, probably it is pre-Christian originally. It may have begun in Persia or Chaldea or one of the other nations of the Near East. But it was the story of a search, a search for the most holy relic of Christendom, the Holy Grail, the cup from which Christ drank at the communion of the Last Supper. The fact that the cup continued to exist is variously supported by myth, by legend, and by certain semi-historical accounts. Probably one of the most prominent and common legends is the, that to the effect that it was brought to Britain by Joseph of Arimathea. He was the one who loaned or gave his tomb for Christ to body to rest in in the Holy Sepulchre. Joseph reached England probably around the year 50 or 60 AD and is supposed to have brought with him the Holy Grail and the handkerchief of St. Veronica. Uh, Veronica herself is said by some to have also been in this small group that under persecution left the Near East, traveled through France, came to the coast of France, and journeyed over to Britain, where they were hospitably received, and where the original church of Glastonbury was built. So as far as the English tradition is concerned, Glastonbury becomes the center of the great uh, grail cycle. Glastonbury is a, a, an area in rather swampy land surrounded by marshes that were known in ancient times as Avalon. And it was to Avalon at the time of his death uh, that Arthur was carried by the mysterious women in the great black barge that took his soul to the afterlife. All of these stories seem to have some kind of a special meaning. The bard sang them, and they were carried through many different cycles of poetry and prose. They appear in the Near East. We find references to them in Islam, but we do not seem to be able to make a solid statement of what is fact and what is fable, what is fanciful and what is symbolical. Perhaps the symbolical development of the story began in Alexandria, which was a mingling ground for practically all of the religions of the world in the period from the 2nd century B.C. to the 3rd century A.D. Here a great many sacred writings were preserved. Here the Gnostics and the Essenes created their schools of thought. 
the Neoplatonists and the Neopythagoreans. And also here, according to the ancient tradition, uh, the first college of Christianity was established by the Apostle Mark. So there are many stories of this particular series of events or cycles, and perhaps it is useful at this time to consider what the meaning might be. The order of the quest was always more or less the same in the story. It was added to a little and subtracted from a little by different writers, but it centered around three distinct objects. One was the Holy Grail, which was the most important of the hallows, as they were called. The second was the spear of the centurion Longinus, which is supposed to have pierced the side of Christ. And the third is the wreath of thorns. These have been variously sanctified in different parts of the world. Great cathedrals of Europe have declared that they possessed these objects. The problem of trying to verify the story is about as difficult as verifying the mystery of the Shroud of Turin. But in the whole picture of it, one point stands out. It is always a search. Every part of the Grail legend dealing with Galahad, the guileless knight, Parseval, Lohengrin, and many others, these were all seeking for something. They were searching for a vision. And it is said that Parseval and Galahad attained the vision of the Grail. And that after the death of Parseval, the Grail was taken to India, where it was enshrined in the kingdom of Prester John, the Christian emperor of Asia. All legend, all myth. But where in all of these stories is there something very important? A, a number of scholars trying to find what was called the hidden church of the Grail finally came to the conclusion that the search was fruitless, that they would never be able to find a church in this world that fulfilled the requirements of this mystery. They finally decided, therefore, that the Church of the Holy Grail was not in the material world, and yet it existed, and that it became part of a great descent of man's aspiration after enlightenment. The search was always the same. The search was for light. The search was for union with reality and was a great dedication, a pilgrimage toward reality. As we go into this, we find an interesting factor presenting itself. And that is that from the beginning there is an overtone in the Grail cycle that seems to suggest that in every instance the, the Grail search must be an individual effort. There was no way of joining something. There was no way of proclaiming a membership or depending upon a group support for the attainment of the quest. You could not become part of a congregation of the Church of the Holy Grail. Every part of it had to be individual. The individual himself was searching to become one with the communion of saints, with those of the other life who had attained the illumination of the soul. It was therefore the soul in man searching for the eternal soul in life. And this search had to be a personal dedication. Those who achieved the search and finally beheld the grail became a company apart, but they were never organized as an organization. They became mutually knowing of each other 
because they had all attained the same level of insight. They were part of a level of internal illumination and not an organization. This seems to meet most of the requirements of the subject, but leads, of course, inevitably to the dedication for the search, a dedication which was part of the vow of knighthood back in the medieval period. The vigil of the grail was always in a church, and a knight receiving ordination into his order spent the first night in prayer and meditation before the altar of his local church. Having thus dedicated himself internally by a voluntary action of his own, he started out on a quest which no one could assist him. No one could do it for him. No one could walk with him. No one must, could must prevent him from making mistakes. It was a lonely journey, a journey from illusion to light, from darkness uh, to participation in eternal truth. This actually did affect the rise of the Christian faith in the early medieval period. The Grail Cycle, regardless of its origin, which may have been among the mystery schools of Egypt, uh, Asia, North Africa, Greece, all of these countries. But wherever it began, it became a key to the religion that had no physical structure, a religion that was entirely subjective, a religion to which each individual made his own commitment. And having made this commitment, either succeeded or failed in either case, alone. Therefore, perhaps the entire quest of the grail is best summarized in the words of Plotinus, who observed on occasion that the way to truth was the journey of a lonely person to that which is eternally alone. It was this aloneness that seems to have been the power of the grail. Each individual had to call entirely upon his own internal resources. He had to train himself, he had to dedicate himself, he had to consecrate himself. He had to master one by one the weaknesses of his own flesh. He had to overcome the pressures and temptations of ambition and avarice. He had to purify his own nature by a vow taken only to the very highest part of himself. He must slowly climb that mountain between his own material nature and the attainment of the enlightenment of his inner soul. It's a very interesting concept and probably has never been fully explored, except that there are records and indications that certain persons apparently achieved this tremendous dedication. Also, it was twisted into the cycle of alchemy at one time, so that the purification of the metals, the transformation of all that is base into all that is sacred, was the great alchemical transmutation performed alone by an alchemist in his little laboratory by prayer and meditation and on rare occasion by some type of miraculous manifestation. To the grail cycle, the miraculous was an internal mystery. It did not deal with the commonplace of life. Miracles did not interfere with the workings of universal law. Miracles were inner experiences of attainment, a proof that the reality was nearer than it had been before. The problem of the origin of the grail, again, has a great many legends associated with it. One legend says that it was carved from the crest jewel of the archangel Lucifer when he fell from heaven. Others say that it was part of the basin of consecration found in the ancient rites of the tabernacle in the wilderness. 
Some believe that it was the ecstatic cup of Bacchus or Dionysus in Greece. In most cases, it was a chalice in which the individual had to find ways and attain to the possibility of cleansing the inside of his own cup, which was the uh, actual meaning of the term. Now, in doing this thought, or living this way, we find that there arose in North Africa and in early Christendom a teaching that was to become very important in the life of people. And this teaching was the cultivation of the power of internal visualization. In other words, the individual gradually transformed these ideals into inner pictures. These pictures, like the oriental mandalas, were visualizations of a superior state of being, visualizations which impel the individual to fulfill them or to achieve the mysteries which they represented. And uh, in some of the old English block books and on the continent also, the uh, gr city of the grail or the church of the grail is placed at the, at the top, of pa top part of the great Ptolemaic system of the solar system. You climb the ladder of the seven planets to reach the entrance of the secret house. This house was above the firmament, and there dwelt together the deity, the triangle, the triangular trinity, and the abode of the blessed. So the uh, whole concept gradually became a series of self-disciplines by means of which the individual sought to remove from his nature all forms of defilement. Therefore, in the search for the grail, there must first be rites of purification. The individual must gradually, to the best of his ability, put his life in order. He will not be able to do so perfectly, that is understood, but he must make a gradual effort to get over the problems by which he is bound to an inferior state by his own center of consciousness. He must get over all grievances. There must be only true and simple uh, acceptance and practice of the noblest form of life which he can experience. Now, if by this type of problem or this type of living, he gradually overcomes the major weaknesses of his own nature, he gradually comes into a state of internal tranquility. And tranquility is the open door to the sanctuary of the grail. Tranquility means peace with reality. It means that the individual accepts without question the true teachings of his religion, whatever it may be, and lives it without restriction or compromise. He must have, therefore, the ability to quiet all of the confusions which beset the average person. Now, confusions are very often things that cannot be overcome easily. Sometimes a life is harassed to the degree that it would not appear that the individual could make a new start in his own inner life. But he can if he will. There is never a time in the life of any living thing that has a consciousness in which that consciousness cannot be released constructively. It is a matter of willingness to be dedicated. Assuming that the person achieves this type of dedication, it might be regarded as an order of knighthood. He becomes the first grade of the search for the grail. And all the knights dedicated their sword handles, which were the form of the cross, to the good fight, the battle to overcome the darkness in self, and to protect the light in others. 
the knights of the garter and so forth were always out protecting people in distress and saving the maiden who was in the hands of the villain. The maiden was the soul, which is always in the hands of the villain until the individual redeems himself. So the knighthood of the grail began by this proof of courage, proof of integrity. The uh, no, young knight did not know what he was going to find. He had no promise that he would find it. He was simply told that his hope was through, only through the conquest of himself, that no one else could help him, and all the prayers in the world could not bring him the peace that he had to earn by the development of his own character. And he might pray for character, but if he did not have the courage to live it, it would not come to him. So having gone through all these problems and coming finally to the Gnostic quietude, the individual lacks none of the needs of life, but has an inner tranquility in which he lives in this world, but not of it. He performs all the duties that are his proper responsibilities in life. All effort to escape responsibility is treason as far as the way of the grail is concerned. Having come to this point, then, he settles down to the next step of his growth, namely what the Oriental has always known, the meditative arts. When we relax, we have all kinds of negative thoughts. We worry, we're frightened, we're concerned, we're disappointed, we're disillusioned. We think of the people who have mistreated us and how the world is failing us in our needs. So to the person who is not self-disciplined, relaxation and quietude just end in misery, which is what is intended because there is no way in which we can accomplish the purpose until we are able to see within ourselves that we have conquered these mistaken points of view. So by degrees, the individual gains the ability to relax and be quiet. Now, this is, has a sort of an initiation with it, because when you get to this point, you've got to relax and be quiet. The individual must learn the importance of being able to get along with himself and that his great enemy has always been himself. And until he conquers that, he can go no further. The descent into limbo represents the individual cleaning out his own subconscious with which he has to live. It is either a paradiso or a purgatorio according to how he has trained it. If he is selfish, his internal subconscious conscious isn't worth living with. In fact, it would be very hard to live with it. And yet we go along day by day, failing to realize that we are building a toxic subconscious, that we are building an internal life and the only way we can escape from it is keep our objective consciousness so busy that we have no time to think about the facts of life. We can get only be comfortable, so to say, if we can get our minds off of ourselves. And usually we find some useless way of doing it. For instance, when we can't stand ourselves any longer, we turn on the television, and as a result of that, our punishment is magnified. <laughs> And as he gradually gets rid of this load of pressures within himself, he begins truly to clean the inside of his own cup. And having attained as far as he can go in this, he will discover that when the inner consciousness of his mind and emotions are at rest, he will for the first time begin to experience the mystery of the invisible source of life. He will discover the teacher self when he is able to overcome the false teachings which he has permitted to uh, overwhelm his life. All these things have to be worked out. 
by those who are going to seek for the mysterious crusade for the grail, who are going to search for the cup of eternity. So this brings the individual to the next general feeling. From the purification of himself comes also then the strengthening of his inner realization of deity. After this, we come to the truly meditational problem. Having cleansed the heart and mind from all traces of ulterior attitudes, the individual can for the first time come into the state of prayer. Prayer up to that time is just a conversation usually with the lower part of yourself. But when that part is no longer there, prayer became, becomes a contact with the highest inspirational levels of consciousness. And because these inspirational levels have the power to perfect or rationalize or make whole all the disasters of the flesh, prayers are answered by the constant increasing of the divine consciousness within the person. Little by little, the, the divine takes over. And where the divine takes over, there is no longer any need for prayer because the individual lives constantly in the light of God. So the gradually the, the church of the Holy Grail concept is the person gradually becoming part of an assemblage of the enlightened. This assemblage of the enlightened we find in the mythology of Egypt and of Greece and of most ancient peoples. Like the mysterious mountain in the ta tablet of Cebes, the person rises finally to a mysterious and wonderful castle on the top of the mountain. This is the castle of the inner life, the consciousness. This is the castle that is referred to in, al in alchemy as the shut, uh, the shut palace of the king. It is the divine acacia, the place of wisdom, love, and veneration. So little by little we climb up and do what in the Buddhist philosophy means that we ascend to the level or degree of bodhisattvahood. So little by little the conquest of self brings with it the only true happiness that exists in this world. And this happiness does not exist completely in this world because it comes to those who, while they live in this world, have attained an understanding and insight of something higher and more wonderful. Now, the story of the cup, of course, has a series of meanings. The cup is the sand grail or the holy cup or the sangre real, which is the container of the blood of Christ. It also has been represented in various forms. If it was a pewter cup or clay cup, which Christ drank from, it was probably long forgotten and broken. But the symbol of it is eternal. Here is the cup which contains the ever-flowing blood of consciousness. It is the quest for the everlastingness which is behind all things as an attribute of deity. The mystic, therefore, very often says uh, that he does not die, that when the time comes for him to depart from this life, some mysterious miracle occurs and he doesn't die. The physical interpretation of this is very, has very little substance in reality. The, the only one who didn't and cannot die is the one who finally was the eternal itself. Therefore, all things have their comings and their goings. But the alchemist and the mystic is t was taught that the transition from this world to the next is not a death. And the perfect acceptance of life overcomes the illusion of the reality of death. In other words, that in which life exists may be transformed. The body of it may be changed. The life may be incorporated into other creatures. But life itself cannot die. The life in the individual cannot die. But it can depart from the body. 
But this departure is not death. It is transition into another dimension of space. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. I'm sorry this one was so long. Please check out my published work on Amazon. Kindly share this video. Please subscribe. Please don't forget to leave a comment. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you again very soon.